Well, welcome along this morning to uh, our Indigenous session. This is actually our third session, and the first for 2015. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be hearing from uh, Eric Barker today on practical UX design. So thanks for joining with us. It's really neat to see so many people from around the world, part of this global community of Indigenous, uh, coming together, at least today, uh, and tuning in on topics that are helping us be more effective in ministry. So I, uh, exciting for me to introduce you to Eric. Uh, Eric's actually a, a good friend of mine and uh, I've known him for about 16 years. Uh, really exciting guy. He's got some real talents, particularly in uh, creative drawing. He's a designer, uh, but beyond that, he's very skilled in user interface design as well. And so we're going to be connecting with him today. Uh, Eric lives in Ohio and uh, in Columbus, Ohio on the east side and uh, is involved in Xenos Church there and really thankful for uh, the work that uh, you guys are doing up there and supporting people like me and, and Connie, Eric and Christian Mission. Glad you can be involved with us today. Love for you to share a bit about uh, your spiritual life, Eric, and why it's important to you as you walk with Jesus and how that's shaping your life. So, welcome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, so I guess God's been shaping my life since high school. Um, um, he's been uh, constantly revealing stuff to me, you know, uh, over the years as far as just my character. But, uh, but I think as far as my passion, um, you know, I've always been kind of a creative guy and always trying to find outlets for that. So um, God's really blessed uh uh, me recently with uh, just the ability to take the experience that I've had in this world, uh, just doing stuff for clients and business, and then start applying some of those skills and experiences to uh, ministry, um, which is really exciting because you know, I think that, you know, that is, man, I love design, I love being in the trenches, I love pushing pixels and, and using inks and, and printing and all that kind of stuff, but, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, I really like... Um, Using those skills to um, make the make you know sharing our faith become something tangible that people can people can relate to and, and make sense of it um, in whatever format it ends up in, digital or print. That's what I love. That's my passion. I, I love being able to I love solving big complex problems for clients and all that kind of stuff. I still like that stuff, but passionately it's it's all about um, being able to do that in a real way and and hopefully in the end um, affect someone you know someone's life for eternally yeah well thanks for being with us this morning Eric just getting some extra people just joining our call uh, as we progress our webinar I think we have around about 40 people who are on board with us uh, today to listen to you to share some insights and uh, really like the the title that you had uh, for this webinar, I think a lot of people do think that uh, the UX stuff is is well beyond their skill set. So we're we're looking mm -hmm. forward to you talking about making that practical and and how we can have a uh, an outside in perspective of what people's experiences. It's important to them how they interact with the message that we're trying to present. So we're excited to uh, hear from you. Um, well, I know you've got a great. Uh, slide deck and, and some material that you're wanting to uh, share with us, Eric. So you're going to take the next 25 to 30 minutes to share that with us and we can actually get questions. So if you're there with us on the webinar and you'd like to ask a question as we go, uh, Eric was sharing with me that it's fine for him to uh, take some interruptions. So if we if we see some questions coming up that are good, uh, we'll, we'll interrupt Eric as he goes. So uh, please feel free to ask your questions and um, over to you, Eric. Yeah, so yeah, definitely uh, throwing the questions. I love interruptions. I've uh, got three kids, so interruptions are all good. Um, so I guess today, you know, one of the things I wanted to um, discuss was the um, just about like removing the smoke and mirrors behind um, behind UX, so that you know we can start. You know, make it more tangible for the rest of us to start using it. Um, you know, you don't. I mean, my big thing was you don't have to be a designer, you don't have to be an artist to to do UX. Um, and so, 
I want to just cover that today. I mean, this is not going to be an exhaustive list of things, but um, but it will give us kind of a, a big picture of what UX really is and, and how you can also do it. Um, so one of the first things I um, kind of wanted to talk about was what UX isn't. Um, UX isn't, isn't UI. So when we talk about UX, we're talking about user experience design. When we're talking about UI, we're talking about user interface design. So, you know, the examples that I have up now, um, I think it gives you a good idea of, you know, what a user experience, uh, user interface design would actually be. So this is where you would, you know, kind of tap into a designer who really loves, you know, designing pixels or print and uh, gets into doing different concepts. So this is a realization example of exploring color, exploring how icons are rendered um, in this particular application, how how elements are rendered, you know, are there shadows, are there not, is it blue, is it green, is there backgrounds, um, kind of creating a look and feel for the environment. So this is not necessarily UX. Um, there is some UX kind of blended in here. This is why you usually see people with titles with UX and UI because um, a lot of the time they do go hand in hand because, um, you know, for instance, in my case, I can, I kind of dabble in both. So, um, so, but in reality, though, what I'm trying to, I guess, with this this webinar is just to communicate that uh, um, UX is something that you know you don't have to go to this level to really um, design a really great user experience. Um, so, the big question for today that you just keep asking yourself is, you know, everyone has an experience. The question is, you know, did you design it? Um, so it's. It comes down to um, it's not just about websites, which is what we typically associate with UX. We, we talk about websites, we talk about applications, but UX design, uh, over my experience, um, actually it blends into product design, blends into spaces, blends into even services. You know how a restaurant services its customers. So um, think about like what was your last shopping experience like? Where do you like to shop? Well, why? Uh, maybe it's because how they treat you, or where the checkout is, or you know, check out an Apple store, for instance. I mean, that their shopping experience is radically different than anything else out there. So it comes down to just about anything that you can design. Uh, it's basically the definition of UX in my book is any interaction you have um, with with humans. Um, think about. Um, Another thing to think about too, just in the ministry sense, is think about the experience that, you know, first time visitors to your church, you know, what kind of experience are they having? You know, are you, um, you know, has that been designed? Is that um, accident by design? Um, maybe it's a good accident. Maybe you guys have learned something. But you know, in my book, I guess I guess I never leave any stone unturned. So um, I always ask the question, oh, we did this great, but now let's ask the question again. Uh, could this be better? Could this be different? What are we missing? Um, so always, always inquisitive. I guess that's uh, kind of where I'm coming from. So the other thing to understand about UX is, is it's not just about um, you know making things easy and intuitive. I mean that's usually when you think UX again, it's all about oh what's the easiest path for the user and what's intuitive. But it is that there's also other things that are not so tangible, um, like you know, is the experience that they're having memorable? Is it, you know, is it desirable? Is it something they want to do? Um, is it thoughtful? Um, and actually, are they enjoying it? Is it delightful for them to actually be a part of it? So sometimes the user experience um, comes down to you know having a kind of creating a smile in their mind. You know, when they're when they're having an experience, like oh, this is this is not what I expected. This is great. Um, to sometimes it is pure function and where it becomes like <laughs> at the end of the day what you're working on just needs to work and it needs to not make the user think um, to get it done. So I guess one of the you know the big things is, is a little bit of history behind UX um, is a quote from um, a designer his name is um, Dieter Rams in the 1980s you know he's kind of like Basically, introduced the concept that you know, at its best, um, design is invisible, and so the best design is as little design as possible, um, which is kind of hard to wrap your head around. But 
you know, from his perspective, he was more of an industrial designer slash product designer, um, we were used to hearing. But, you know, so he deals with a lot of the physical and as far as products go, the things you interact with on a daily basis. Now, you know, we've crossed into, you know, the whole realm of introducing data and, um, and technology to our everyday lives and how do we seamlessly do this? How do we make it invisible to us as users on this level? So in our ministry, if we've got a website, you know, people are having a user experience, having an experience with your website one way or another, um, whether you designed it or not. And so as, as far as being invisible, you know, some of the stuff that we're seeing today, um, probably very familiar with, but like for instance, um, weather apps, you know, a, 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 an invisible design is, is, you know, I pull up my weather app and it automatically knows where I'm at, so I get the weather for where I'm located, but I also get, on top of that, it's pulling an image from where I'm at, so I'm getting a location that's near where I live, and, and it's also even potentially even capturing the image um, of the weather conditions that it's showing on the screen. So again, nothing that I actually did, all I did was ask for the weather, and here I'm getting this experience of, oh, you know, there's something very visual, um, there's something very um, relational, so, you know, something that I'm, I, I know, I know this place that I've been. So it's, it's creating an experience. Um, and so I guess that um, it almost seems like magic sometimes. So, you know, you pull this up and you see, you know, your location, it's like, wow, yeah, that's really cool, it saw me there. But in reality, at the end of the day, all of these things that, that kind of almost feel like automatically happening um, are carefully designed user experiences. So the other thing I want to talk about, too, is, you know, there's, I guess, being in the industry, working with a lot of clients since, you know, the early 90s, um, user experience design didn't really have a name, user experience design, um, but it still existed. Um, whether it just just under the design banner and, and you know the big question we are always fighting is is like clients were like well that doesn't matter we just need to make the product we need to do a certain thing but in reality it does matter um, there's a lot of um, reasons um, behind why you should slow down and take a little bit of time at, at the very minimum and think about the users and and what you're actually providing them um, some of the stuff just to rattle off a few things that I think are of um, importance here is that um, a quality user experience, especially now these days, people are starting to see the benefits of it. Is there, you know, they're starting to realize that a quality user experience will will differentiate them as a company from, from their competitors, or, or in ministry case, differentiate differentiate your ministry or your church from other churches around you. Um, you know, also. It also helps form an impression, the first impression from um, from the users as they as they engage. Like, like what's the first impression that they get about you? Um, you need to consider that. Um, it also determines whether someone's ever going to come back. So you know, they go on your website and they're looking for something and they can't find it, or it's you know just too difficult and there's too many things blinking at them. Um, you know. They're not really going to want to come back because it didn't. They didn't really get what they were after. Um, and second of all, what's even worse than that is that they're never going to share it with anybody else. And if they do, it's probably going to be a bad report. Um, the other one that is a good potential is is that you develop something that's um, you know truly a um, truly a, a, a separator for them, like a, like a, in the business term, a market separator. So for instance, like, you know, you get, you, you develop something truly unique and innovative and people start using it. And there's other products out there, but they've become so used and savvy with using your approach to things, then, then they stick with it. Um, you know, I think, you know, let's bring up Apple again, but, you know, Apple has kind of set the bar high in that aspect is that, you know, people are getting used to using an iPhone or an iPod a certain way and accessing their music a certain way and and it's what they've become accustomed to and to switch to an Android system would be um, different for them, too different. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing too for a lot of the clients that I work with is it, it's a good place to kind of draw a line in the sand for 
create benchmarks so that you know we because there's always room for improvement. Um, it's always been my motto is like you know oh we're done with the project but okay so what can we do better now um, with this project? So uh, it creates benchmarks benchmarks for clients and and, and anyone really um, to say okay this is where we've been this is what we did this is what was successful okay so we're sticking with these things but moving forward and improving these things. So it's, it, it draw, helps draw a line in the sand to improve upon. Um, but then I think that the other big thing is, is um, that we've seen a lot in the benefits of UX is, is in the support aspect. So take the time to um, to take the time to um, spend, you know, looking at talking about support as far as like if you're having technical issues like for instance we had a client who you know had a lot of products coming back and people were turning their products and complaining about their products because you know they could never they never know when it was charged or how to charge or when it needed charged because when the thing with the sleep the screen went completely blank so merely just looking at that and hearing those issues that then we dive into um, looking at like well what if we put some kind of screen animation on there to let them know that the machine is actually running um, and that that it needed a charge and had a battery display that was more you know more prominent pr predominant on the screen. So I think that um, you know for them that's an immediate benefit. Um, you know they they reap benefit on that because they spent less time trying to tech support a problem that really wasn't a problem. Um, you know that customers thought were, but it was leaving an impression on customers' mind that they had an unreliable product um, when really they they didn't. Um, so diving into do-it-yourself UX, so kind of talking about more of the practical aspects of this, um, I think the, the first step of this is learning. Um, so some of these images are going to be a little digitized, but some of these images I really love and um, capture what I'm after here. So learning is really uh, the big thing here. Um, this, is the, this is the step. If you're going to do UX, this is a step you can't miss. Um, you need to take the time, you know, and it doesn't take a lot of budget to learn um, or, or a bunch of resources. Um, you can, let's say you get a project and, and you need to, you go look up similar products and services in that, in that particular genre of what you're doing. You um, look at competitors, look at other churches and what they're doing, um, talk to users. Um, you know, you know, you you know what some of your users are, your age group. Um, go out and just engage with some of them, or your friends, or your family. Um, there's no, there's no. You know, everyone's a user at the end of the day. Um, talk to experts. Um, you know, if you if you don't have time to go out and find people to talk to, you know, talk to the people who know the most about what you're trying to do. So, in the business sense, um, for us, you know, a lot of the time our experts were our, was actually our client, who you know, had tech support, technicians that serviced the products or serviced the, the, the industry that they were in, and they had boots on the ground experience like no other, and they could tell you exactly what the issues are and what the customers are struggling with and, and what they hear on a daily basis. So, again, going out, spending that time, and just talking to people. Um, you know, questions, simple questions you can ask, you know, is, First thing, who are the users? What's my audience? Who am I trying to who am I trying to design this experience for? What are they trying to do? When are they using it? You know, are they driving? Are they sitting at home? Um, what, what, where is it? Um, when do they need it? When do they design? You know, what? When do they need it, and how are they doing it now? So, so for instance, like if I'm, you know. If I'm checking movie times to go to a movie, you know, when do I need it? Well, I'm going to typically be doing that on the fly when I'm driving or uh, planning a, a night out. Um, you know, I need to determine like when is this person actually going to be doing this, and um, and and ask the big question: How are they doing it now? Um, and that 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 reveals a lot of the potential opportunities there to improve the experience. Um, and then the last question to ask in my book is: Is is there an opportunity here? So after going through some of these different asking these questions, is there an opportunity to um, kind of plug in and improve something and create something truly unique? Um, so the other thing, kind of walking away from that now, is if you have the time, you have the budget, um, 
really encourage you guys to, to just visit or observe people in the environment that you're trying to, to create an experience for and watch them, see what they do. You know, this image here, even though it's very pixelated, paints a really interesting picture, right? So you can see the user experience here. They're trying to get from point A to point B. Well, someone designed the path on the left there, but users are going to the right. But if I hadn't actually gone out into the field and looked at this particular site, um, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know what what the you know what was actually happening and where they were going. So where is that path lead? Why why are they going that direction? Is it apartments? Is it you know something they shop? Is it lunch? You know what is it that's driving that that path there? And learn from it. Um, you know, in, in the business field, I think a lot of the I think a lot of the stuff. Um, from the business sector is, is that you know we we would spend time we would go out and actually we did a lot of medical products and we had a lot of experience doing medical products and a lot of the um, what's really interesting is is that we would go out in the field and we would talk to nurses doctors and, and see how they're interacting with the product and see what other influences and things that are happening in their schedules you know the burdens that they have in their jobs. Um, of meeting patients' needs as well as meeting certain time constraints to, you know, and fulfilling all the insurance needs and all this kind of stuff, all, all these different factors coming together. And you learn and you gather and you collect this data and, and, and their messages. Um, but then sometimes, like, like this one, for instance, is we were walking around the facility and we were looking at the product that was hanging on the wall that we were there to study, and there on the wall was a piece of paper of someone who had taken the time dealing with that product and wrote down all of these things about the product. Well, check the battery and if it's doing this, do this and oh, and be careful because the plug falls out if you try and hang it this way. And, you know, right there on the wall was the experience they were having with the product um, and they were trying to create, the, you know, trying to create a solution for it and help others in the office solve the problem. So without that observation, we never would have discovered that. So I really encourage um, Taking the time to see someone in their in their environment, um, having the experience that they're having, whether it's good or bad. Um, so after learning, you want to define things. So you've learned so many things, um, and now you need to go and define them. Um, so defining these needs that they have, defining the desires that they have. Um, and something else I like to call you know the nice to haves like the things that they would, oh it'd be nice if you did this but it's not it doesn't break the it doesn't break the the actual cycle of you know whatever you're developing but it is a nice feature to keep um, and then opportunities so with just a little bit of observation you can discover a lot of opportunity that um, users typically can't speak to or you know actually um, verbalize. But if you keep your eyes open, you can kind of watch what they're doing, um, and you can uncover some really interesting things that could improve the experience that they're having. Uh, whether it be in your church, again, this goes back. I mean, I know we're we're kind of focusing a lot here on the on the web and, and the application side of things, but um, all of these things can be brought back to um, just the experience that you're having, you know, within your own church or your ministry or the experience people are having with you and they meet you. So. So I think that um, some of the tactics here, then, so a lot of this can be really overwhelming because defining is is a bit of a challenge sometimes because if you if you've got a lot of research and you're able to spend a lot of time like some of the projects we we were able to spend a couple of days and other times we were able to spend months um, gathering data and, and feedback on things and you end up with a ton of data and it's just a you know it's a bunch of text on the page and numbers so in reality you need to kind of translate that into something tangible that you can kind of focus on and move down the road. Um, one of the ways to do that, not to kind of be overwhelming some of the stuff, examples here, but one of the ways to do that is just build a simple matrix. You know, use um, Excel or something along those, a, a spreadsheet software, and just simply start ranking it. And by ranking it, you either ask questions about, you know, what's most important to the user, but you can also, based on who you talk to, you can also gather pretty quickly you know, well, five out of ten people complained about this very thing. Um, and right there, there's something to focus on um, as a potential, um, as something to 
put your effort and resources into. Um, another thing that you hear a lot with UX is personas and developing personas for for your users so that you can have kind of a, uh, a focus point that you can go back to and make sure that, okay, we've, we've gotten the design phase of this, now we need to go back and actually say, you know, what are we really, are we really meaning what are, what the people that are using this, this, you know, people in this experience, are we really meeting their needs and their desires? Um, I think you can see some examples up there on the, on the top of the screen that, you know, some pretty, these are pretty well developed um, personas that give you a, a good range of information about experience and and products that they use and and personality and kind of lifestyle, um, but you know don't let that be overwhelming because um, there's a lot simpler ways to do it as well um, that you can do just with a small team of people, um, you know, with a whiteboard and post-it notes. Um, one way um, that we actually do that is is that. Um, kind of what you see on the screen here and define is, is it's a simple equation, a uh, simple form to go through when you're looking at a, use, a user scenario. So first is, you know, on the practical side, who, who are we talking about? We're talking about, um, we're talking about truck drivers, for instance, for people that are um, you know, on the go and delivering products every day um, and identifying what their needs are. Well, what's their need? Well, they need to fill up their truck. They need to get fuel uh, to keep their truck going. Um, but they need to do it quickly because you know they make money when they're on the road. So they they don't make money when they're sitting at the gas station. They make money when they're traveling down the road and their truck's moving. So their need is to refill quickly. Um, what are the desires? Well, the, obviously the desire to do it quickly, but um, that they can um, get in and out of a truck stop really, really quickly. So needs and desires are two different things to weigh here. Sometimes it is a need. They need to get on the road. A desire may not apply. It's okay to, to not fill in that aspect. Um, so they need to get fuel quickly so that what? So they can get down the road and make money, right? But what's the problem? Uh, the fuel tank's broken. The, you know, the fuel doesn't deliver as quickly as possible, um, you know, or, or, or their credit card's not working, or the system's not working, they have to go in the building to, to sign up and turn the pumps on, whatever it may be, but, so that but. So the but is the thing that's blocking them from achieving that, that need that they have. And so then the other thing you tack on the end there is what's the opportunity? Well, opportunity is, well, we could, we could build a, we could put a kiosk out at the, at the, at the gas pump. We could, we could um, invest in faster pumps, you know, all these different things that you could create was opportunity here. So this simple equation, simple little form of that you can fill out quickly, you can do just on the fly with a small group of people, or even yourself, you know, depending on what your resources are. You know, identify the who, their needs and or desires, or both, um, so that they can do something. Um, but what's the what's the thing blocking them or the obstacle in their way, and what's the opportunity? Simple equation works really, really quickly in identifying some goals. Um, so the thing across the bottom here, so this is an example of you know really long research process, but identifying again the same same thing. What do we focus on? What did we hear? What's most important to these people? What's most frustrating to the users when they're trying to do a certain step of the process? So this is a process from step, you know, from bringing a patient in to them walking out of the building from a from a from a medical office, and what are some of the challenges that they face from a user perspective, from a doctor perspective, from a nurse perspective, um, when engaging with them, and how can we how can we improve that experience? Because ultimately, that's going to differentiate um, our product or service from someone else's. The next thing, once you've kind of defined um, what you've been after, the next thing is to map it. Um, and again, this can be very, very simple, like the thing above, just a simple sketch on a wall or, or post-it notes and just kind of mapping out like either um, from, a, from a web or an application perspective, you know, you want to talk about, you want to work on like, what are the categories? How is the information organized? What's the architecture of the site where that information lives? And, so we can deliver it as quickly as possible to our users um, to actually going through a decision tree and a logic map of, okay, they're new. what's a new user doing? Well, they're coming in, they need to register, and then they need to do this, 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 and this, and this. So we need to capture that into a map, a roadmap, a blueprint, 
for us to follow. Um, otherwise, you're kind of meandering through the design phase, but you need this kind of um, foundation to be able to focus and identify the unique um, things. And it, really, the step here is it helps um, helps you see the dead ends, um, the conflicts that are going to happen in your app or your website or whatever the experience may be, and potentially what's missing. Um, so that you don't end up running into that near as much. You, you always, it always gets messy towards the end, but, but this is to help kind of reduce that, um, to identify a lot of those things up in the, in the front end. Um, and it can be really simple. You know, a map, I mean, don't get hung up on, oh, I've got to get this software, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do it a certain way. A map, again, can be a sketch and a walk, and post-it notes, but you can also invest in the software if you've got a pretty complex um, problem to solve. If you know you want to have some flexibility where you're not having to redo things all the time, where you can just shift things around and reorganize. So again, use what makes sense um, and what's efficient for you. Um, next thing is to visualize it, and this can be kind of a scary thing, I think, for UX, and I think it's what shies people away from doing this. But I guess I want to encourage you that being a UX person as well as a UI person. Um, from the UI perspective, let's put that hat on for a second. Any sketch nap on a napkin or or uh, or even an example of another website that does it a certain way, um, no matter how messy it is, is beneficial to a designer. So I tried to capture here like there's two ways, and you, know, you can look at the sketch up above, which is very very rough, doesn't even address some of the some of the actual terms and things that you're actually talking about here. But it does paint a picture in the process of how someone's going to go through something in my vision. It puts it down on paper for the designer to interpret and translate. Um, and then to the to the other extreme, which is down below, which is actually going into, you know, what's the words on the page? What are we titling this thing? Um, and actually creating a, you know, a really robust solution of visualizing how things are kind of coming together. And, um, you know, this takes time, but again, it doesn't take a whole lot of resources, it just takes the time to invest in it. And, and you can use something as simple as PowerPoint to do it. Um, there's been a number of times that we've gotten, you know, I've received PowerPoint presentations of people <laughs> extensive, you, you know, user experiences and user interface kind of wireframes um, in a massive PowerPoint, because this is what they're familiar with. And you know what? At the end of the day, it was pretty impressive for <laughs> their skill set, but at the end of the day, it was really helpful. Um, because it allowed designers to dive in really, really quickly and start, um, you know, solving the problems and the visuals. Um, I guess, I guess the when you're when you're as far as the wireframing goes, is you know, don't try to get too hung up in is it shadowed here? Like we talked about earlier with UI, you know, you don't need to get hung up with. Um, a lot of the details, like, oh, is the background the sky? Is it, you know, is does it make this kind of noise when this is clicked on? You know, that's getting really, really into the trenches, and you need to trust your designers with that and um, down the road. But what what you can do, what wireframes allow you to do, is to be able to show emphasis. So, for instance, you can see, oh, I see as a, you know, this is the most important thing I need to do this day. I need to click on the login button or sign up or or this or that. Um, so it shows a level of orientation. Um, so you can wireframes give you the ability to put. Well, I really want the navigation up top, and this is why. Um, also gives you opportunity, like I said before, uh, to be able to name things. Um, and you know, don't ignore what's familiar. Um, I think there's a you, know, you can learn a lot from a lot of different, and especially in the in the web realm and the application realm, you can learn a lot just from what's out there already. And, and some of the industry standards that, that have actually already developed, um, like you know, the login. Your login's typically at the top and typically to the right, um, so it wouldn't make a lot of sense to create a new website or new app and put it in the bottom left. Um, you know, it's just um, you know that's it, it's taking what we know and, and start applying these things. So, so a lot of these details. Um, you can get lost in details, but again, know that you do not have to have incredible sketching skills here to, to get this to the next level. Um, it really helps um, get people, it helps your designers um, visualize and understand what you're shooting for as far as the experience. 
Um, and then I guess the big thing with UX kind of closing up here um, is testing it. And so I guess I guess the nugget I want to leave you with is, is that you know don't uh, wait too long. Um, I think that the um, you know we tend to and I, I'm guilty of it as well. I want to get everything kind of in a perfect situation because I don't want to present something that's inaccurate. But really, what we found um, over the years is is that um, it's best to test early and test as many times as possible. So you can see an example up above, a simple sketched wireframe of here's what we're kind of thinking, and getting that in front of a user and then allowing them, giving them a highlighter and just let them circle the things that's really interesting or the things they don't understand or, or asking them, like, how would, what, what does that mean to you? What does that button do? And see if it resonates with them. See what you were thinking actually makes sense. And, you know, that'll, again, get you there that much quicker as far as identifying that. Two, you know, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a lot of time when you think of testing, you think of, you know, focus groups and, and one-way one -way windows and people behind with video cameras and all this kind of stuff, which is great, you know, if you've got the budget and you're wanting to really capture and, and see people and how they're doing things. Um, but there's a lot of drawbacks to doing that, too, because you, you miss some of the uh, down-to-earth kind of, like, just conversational stuff, and I guess... One of the myths is, is that you know you need all of this information, you need all of these resources, and you need to you know spend this time and do all this this uh, setup and, and prep and all this kind of stuff. In reality, you can actually get a pretty good idea of a user experience, whether it's in the digital realm or in the physical realm or a service or a church service, whatever it may be, from talking to just three people. Um, talk to three people that use that product and and just have a conversation with them or watch them do you know something that you know you're trying to you know see if there's anything to improve upon you will I mean the big myth is, is it's not enough to talk to just three people but the truth is is and the scary thing is is you're gonna find more problems than you have time and resources to fix just talking to three people um, so don't be afraid to just um, take it over, take a printout of, I mean, the stuff you see across the bottom was a simple wireframe, black and white, that was presented to um, nurses and saying, like, okay, so this is kind of what we're thinking as far as hierarchy and how things are, you know, positioned and oriented on the page or on the screen for this product. And, you know, immediately they would be able to, they immediately go, oh, it's the one on the right, no question. And, and, you know, you thought this would be a big deal, but in reality, all it did was narrow in and, and get us to focus and spend our time on other things down the road. So don't be afraid to dive in with, with what you have um, and get that feedback when you can get it. So I think that uh, leaving kind of last thing here, I just, you know, don't be afraid of UX. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not... Um, it can be, you know, it's, it can be super complicated. You can make it complicated, but you can also design it to be really, really easy and to get you there a lot faster. Um, so I encourage you, you know, focus on some really practical ways. I hope, I hope this has given you some, kind of a, in a nutshell, some practical ways and approaches to, to walk through something. Hey, thanks, Eric. That's uh, a lot for us to absorb and appreciate you putting a little bit of process into helping us structure that. I think something that would be really helpful for those who are watching right now would be to see you live out a little bit of this process that you're explaining on a, on a small project. And so we're going to take the next five minutes if you could uh, have a look at um, indigenous.org. So we're, we're going to get very vulnerable and pick out a, a, a website. So we'll, we'll actually look at ourselves and Having you here is a real asset. So if you could open up indigenous.org, Eric, I'd like you to sort of work through the process of what you're explaining about a user experience. Put yourself in the shoes of, uh, uh, you are a designer, so put yourself in your shoes as you think about joining the indigenous.org community. And it'd be good if you could just focus on, you know, there's a lot of elements inside of indigenous.org, but I'd like to just pick on one thing as a user experience and I want you to focus on, joining the community, understanding the community, what is community about. So if, if you could debunk community at indigenous.org as it's displayed in our current website, and we'll watch you and 
you're just thinking out loud. You just This is you in your office as you're thinking out through this process, and we'd like to just see how you do that because we'd probably like to do something similar on other projects we own. So uh, where you go, buddy. Everybody's got your attention now. <laughs> um, well, I think that... Um you know, I guess the big question is, is you know, do you want that to become the focus of the site? And you know, based upon kind of rolling in here um, for the first time and, and on on the landing page, I think there's a lot to a lot of question here. Is like, well, this is kind of sharing what's on the site, but this isn't really calling me to uh, action, right? To actually do something. Um, so if we're going to focus on the community side of things, you know, I think I get here and it's like, oh, here's the community, and this is kind of, kind of what I would expect. You know, it's like, oh, here's the members. Okay, well, this is cool. I can see kind of different people in here, but what's this community actually doing um, that is um, engaging for me to actually be a part of? And you know, what is it you want me to be a part of? And I, I think that's a big question here for me. Um, you know, as a designer coming in the outside, and, and that's what this community is for, is to kind of connect people and understand the concept behind it, um, be involved in it. But um, but I think that uh, the challenge here, I think, you know, some of the stuff um, is, is, you know, to get me engaged is give me some examples of what that looks like. So if I want to get people engaged, um, I need to actually show them, like, other people getting engaged so that I can get an idea of what, you know, for instance, what kind of commitment would be um, to that. And, and also, like, also the potential of sharing, like, what can I engage with? Like, the commitment, but also, like, um, you know, is there a design need? Oh, okay, well, yeah, I can chime in on that. Um, but if there's a strategy need or a, or a need for copywriting or things like that, then, you know, that's not something I'm going to relate to. But if you could show me a way, um, show me the needs that are out there and, and, what, and, and what kind of commitment um, involved there, that would be a, um, a pretty cool thing. I think that, um, I think another thing is, is, you know, even, I think one thing that would be really cool is, because this community thing is, um, it's kind of, you know, you could put projects out here and actually say, okay, well, this project, um, do you want to be a lead on this project and help drive it? Or do you want to be the designer and just be a supportive role? Do you want to be a consultant role and just actually review things along the way? Um, or do you actually want to be in the trenches and actually own this project and be responsible for getting it done? Um, you know, and, and actually provide a, a level of engagement that you know professionals or or missions can actually in, you know get involved and in, and actually be a part of it, but also you know know what kind of commitment they actually have to make. How do you think the most economical way is that we could actually showcase that on a two-dimensional property there? So I think I like your point, showing what engagement looks like. Um, and at the moment, you've got a screen up. There's lots of people. It's not really showing what the engagement of the people is. Are you thinking, like, insert a little video or, like, just expand on that for 25 seconds? Yeah, so, uh, sorry, I, I can ramble. Um, I guess I guess for me is you know what can we learn from the current you know environment in the web? Um, I think there's a lot to be learned from Kickstarter, um, and that is you know what if you landed on this community page and it's like you had all these people that are proposing projects, and they're like hey we want to do this and maybe they do a video maybe they do a slide deck whatever it is, but they come in here and actually present the project and, and get have a vision for it. And then there's just, um, and then all of a sudden you can see, like, oh, maybe this page now says, hey, this is the uh, indigenous project for this event. And then these are the people that are actually on the project, and what, and there's a note here about what they're contributing and, and how to reach them. And so now you've created kind of a team. And okay. um, be kind of cool. Yeah, that is kind of cool. So, uh, a last couple of comments, Eric, just about this. Uh Community section. You you said you you come in here. It says our community. You you're looking at a page. There's some some faces in here. Um, the message here. You're saying that it's not really big on engagement. There's not a major call to action here. Um, and so you're saying that could be improved. Um, last couple of comments about uh, this this community thing, and even from just your own experience about being part of communities. 
Yeah, I guess I guess to be a part of a community is, um, you know, you know, right here it's like you've got you know, search balloon, connect with others, connect and Jesus digital strategies, want to join, you create an account. Well, that's great, but I think that I can create an account, but that's not really what I want to hear. I want to hear like, um, you know, this community. There's a there's an opportunity here for you to be a part of something, um, to actually dive in. And what's the call to action? The call to action is, is that, you know, for me, is like, you know, be a part of this and be a part of something bigger than what you're involved in and, and be a part of a team that's going to really create something innovative. Um, and I think that, I think the challenge is, is that being able to, um, you know, to, to get this away from the idea that it's just a place to connect with people, in reality, there's, there's a purpose behind it. And so, so actually getting those projects out there um, and sharing some of the people that are passionate about it and allow them to kind of just jump on the bandwagon and be a part of it, um, I think would be huge um, to be able to get this community, you know, just grow, um, you know, like wildfire. And so, so would, yeah. you, would you suggest, Eric, like that framework that you, you wrote out, like the questions running from left to right that you did with the truck driver guy, like... We could just put community in there, plug that word in there, and then walk through that little process, asking a few questions, and come out and look for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, because I think that you know it's like, well, what would keep Eric, the designer, from joining this community? Well, I don't really see a reason for me to join unless I just want to connect with other people that are in my field. Um, but again, why do I want to connect with them? Give me a reason to. So I think that um, you can definitely walk through that scenario and say, as a designer, here's the designer, and, and what are we trying to, what's his need and desire, or her need and desire to, to be a part of this community, um, and then be able to walk through and, and figure out, well, what's the barrier here? Well, the but is, is that I don't see, you know, I just see a, a contact list. I don't see a community, and I think okay. that's the biggest challenge. I see here. We're just going to go to a couple of questions. If uh, people there have um, been asking a few questions, Eric, so I'll share a couple of questions with you, and then we're going to uh, look at a little bit of homework, talk about our next Indigenous session, and then uh, it's going to be time for today. So first up, question here from, uh, from Roland. Uh, he's asking, uh, let me read this question. In terms of your steps that you gave, learn, define, map, visualize, test, which of these steps do you spend the most time with or put the most emphasis on? So those were those steps, learn, define, map, visualize, test. Which of those do you put the most time into, Eric? Yeah, I guess I, guess, um, I enjoy spending the most time in the visualizing side of things. Um, but I think uh, strategically it, it's always a bit of a challenge for me. The, the, for me, the most important time to spend is is in the is in the learning phase, um, because this can make all the other phases go much much smoother. Um, if you can do a lot of extensive learning up front, that's that's where I typically like to start, because you don't want to find out, you know, three steps into the process um, that you miss something completely because you didn't talk to this type of user. Um, then all of a sudden it completely could ruin your whole you know move and you got to go back and do a bunch of rework. So learning for me is the most important step. Okay. It's probably the one that most of us want to skip over very quickly because we, we already think that we know everything. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely a challenge. Well, maybe that's just me. <laughs> uh, another question here from Silas. Um, he's asking, how does brand and UX fit together well? How, how could you describe how UX supports brand and vice versa? So how does brand and, and UX, user experience, fit together well? I mean, could you describe how the user experience supports the brand or the brand supporting the user experience? How do those things go together? Yeah, that's tough, um, you know, because a lot of that is it's not something really tangible a lot of the time. So I think, um, you know, i try trying to say something very familiar, like, like an Apple. Everyone's familiar with Apple. Um, I think a lot of the, 
uh, as far as brand um, um, is, you know, their big thing is to not make people think um, when they're using their products. Um, so, so for to stay on brand, so that when I go from, you know, an iPhone three to an iPhone six, um, that I'm going to have a similar experience across the board because that's what I expect. Um, so I think there there comes a point where it's like, well, you think you think that's like, well, that's just Apple's already decided that's the way things are doing, and they just do it, and and there's no a lot of UX involved in that brand development. But that brand development, that UX and brand are like synonymous most of the time in the in in the in the industry. Those two teams are constantly working together. They're sharing the space. They're working closely together just to make sure that. Um, that the design side of things and the brand side of things are consistent across the board as new products and new things come out. So to keep that approach of simple and not making people think and keeping that focus is something UX can spend as far as the brand goes. So it's, it's, it's not all the same uh, every time for every client. Uh, sometimes the brand is, is a product that doesn't break, you know, that, that that is dependable. So why do you capture that? You know, what's the user experience of that? It's it's not just bullet points on the side of the box or or how it's sold on a website. It comes down to well, what's the user experience when they're interacting with that product to the point to where the user experience actually affects the industrial design of the product, so that it doesn't break. So UX had injects at almost every phase of the of the, of the brand building and, and the products that that brand actually sells. We've got another question here uh, from Doug. He's just asking about um, using and testing of wireframes. Um, mm. His particular question is really how do you do that with people in different cities? It's all right if you're in the same office. Um, how would you do that uh, globally? I mean, perhaps you want to introduce Doug to Gliffy, Eric. Well, I think that, yeah, so I think that um, there's a lot of online tools. Um, that you can use. One that I use pretty regularly is InVision, um, and it's a great way to put images out there and allow people to interact with it as well as make comments. And um, There's all kinds of really well-developed apps out there. There's probably more than I can even count. Um, so it's not a lack of apps. It really comes down to, um, you know, stepping back a second, there's, there's not a lack of apps, but also you can actually have simple user experience is just doing a Skype chat and and actually just sharing your screen and walking somebody through it or sending the document to them and, and letting them walk through it as you observe them and and let them pose the questions and challenges that they see. So you can you can get sophisticated and, and have the eye tracking technology and cameras on and capturing every you know what they're actually doing and all that kind of stuff. But you can also go down to just as simple as, as doing a screen share with someone and walking them through the ideas um, and capturing them that way. So there's lots of ways to, to actually do it. Um, but, uh, you know, you, de you don't have to, again, coming back, it doesn't, you know, you see all these fancy ways of doing things with UX. And really, it's really you just got to get in front of your, in front of your users and, and show them something. I know I just had to learn Gliffy this year, and Gliffy's a free thing. It's web-based. You can um, you can use it on any machine. Doesn't matter what OS you're running. You can make up a quick wireframe, drag and drop little boxes, and it snaps all the flow diagram arrows, process arrows quickly, and you can share that as a PDF or a JPEG. So go and have a look at Gliffy. Go and have a look at Envision. Oh, it looks like we're done with questions. Um, we're going to move on to homework. We'd love to give you guys some homework. We watched Eric as he just kind of stepped through our indigenous.org property and, and took a small critique of the community side of things. And uh, we, we looked at that framework that he gave us to ask questions and, uh, and looking for the opportunity. We want to give you guys some homework. Uh, we know that there's lots of different properties that you guys are in control of, um, be they web properties that are interacting with people on the outside. Um, or even if they're just, as Eric was saying, even an experience you have in a small group or a church or something that you're in control of. So I'd like you guys to think about what is that that you're in control of and and, it, and then take the framework that Eric's given and uh, we'd like you to apply it. So if you could 
use those principles to evaluate that current user experience that you're in control of and, and critique it and then see what you come up with in terms of there being an opportunity. And if you could post that to our Indigenous Facebook um, group, that would be great. So uh, that's your guys' homework. Um, there's also uh, a survey at the end of this session. And so if you guys, as you exit our session today, uh, could please take, take that survey and give us some feedback. And then the last thing, is our next session that's coming up with Ario. Uh, and that session is going to be entitled Get Off Your Island, How to Build Kingdom Partnerships. And so it's not so much about the digital space, although it does apply to that, but Ario is going to be taking us through how partnerships are really important and how we can't do what we do in isolation in an island. So. He's going to be explaining about how to get a kingdom mentality going and how to effectively build partnerships. Ario works with Jesus.net, and they've got some great partnerships going on, so I'm sure you'll be excited to see little, some of the inner workings as Ario helps us to think through partnerships. So that's next session, which is coming up. So thanks for being with us. You can view the past sessions at our website. I want to say thank you to Eric for making time and uh, – Take drilling down and helping us with uh, a way that we, as non-professionals in the UX area, can think about something that's so important uh, in terms of what our users and those whom we're trying to reach, um, how we can make those processes work better. So thank you, Eric.